Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ the Servant King. Thank you. Um, my name's Chris. I'm the vicar here. And uh, we've got Martin and Elaine leading the band. Yeah. We've got a technical team who are at the back connecting us up with the people who are on Zoom at home or on holiday or wherever you are. Um, good morning and welcome. And uh, for the people who are watching later on on YouTube. I don't know what weeks you've come from. I don't know what things you've, you've come from at home. I don't know what's going through your mind. I don't know what's going through your heart. But do you know, we come and meet each other in church, but we also meet the, the maker who made us. We gather in the presence of the God who knitted us together in our mother's wombs. We gather in the presence of the God who made the mountains and the seas. The God who we believe flung the stars into space, who spoke life into this world. And so we gathered, not just, not just for a meeting, this isn't just a, a get together, we gather in the presence of the living God. And we gather to praise him, and we gather to celebrate him, and we gather to learn, and we gather to open up ourselves to him and his power. So I'm going to pause and pray, and then the band are going to lead us in some songs of worship. Let's just make ourselves still and quiet in the presence of God. Lord, thank you that we can come as we are into your presence. Lord, thank you that you welcome us in. that as we gather, you work here in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. And so we pray that you would work in us, transform us, and make us new in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we're comfortable and pray God, praise God together.
arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find us always there. The Lord my shepherd I Good Shepherd, would you walk with us today? Would you guide us? Would you lead us? Would you inspire us in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Welcome. We are going to continue with the reading of a psalm. And uh, Martin, who's been reading the psalms each morning, weekday morning here in church, is going to read Psalm 13 for us this morning. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. 
My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Martin, thank you. Um, we've been reading out, uh, well, Martin's been reading out the Psalms here at 10.30 each weekday morning for the last week and a half since Lent started. And he'll be going on with that, and there might be a substitute or two, a couple of days of Lent. Um, but he'll be doing that up until uh, Easter week. So I, I'd encourage you, I've been about half the time so far, but each time I've been here, hearing the Psalms spoken out, the way they're intended, they're not, they're not so much intended to be just read from a book, they're intended to be declared and spoken. Hearing them read, new things have struck me each time, and a kind of a new kind of sense of the language of God spoken through the words of men has kind of gripped me and, and I'm preaching this morning on on the Psalms and the kind of like the little phrase that was in my head was the the idea of the heart song it, it's not just it's not just what's going on in your head it's not just what you're thinking it's what's coming from very deep within you and the Psalms are like a handbook for how we can talk to God to, um, on that subject the subject of talking to people do you know what huge special event is happening in this country this summer or late spring summer so it's gonna be the first time it's happened in 70 years <laughs> barbecue <laughs> do you know it feels like that doesn't it it feels like that it feels like it's been a long time since the last barbecue but it's not been 70 years. What last happened 70 years ago in this country? Now, you know what? The nine o'clock congregation, who are generally older than this congregation, got it just like that. They all said it. The coronation. It's the coronation of King Charles. Now, I heard a story. I heard a story about the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And it, it, was, it was a story from somebody who was there in the crowd as a young man when when the day queen elizabeth was was crowned 70 years ago and the the, the mall and the like all of the different bits of london were all packed with people who were there to kind of get a glimpse but they all kind of crammed in outside buckingham palace and there were people like looking from like a mile away with binoculars and they were all there in this huge huge crowd and every now and then a chant would start up we want the Queen, we want the Queen. And it would just ripple and echo through this enormous crowd. And do you know what? Queen Elizabeth II, a young monarch, just freshly crowned, she didn't deny people the opportunity. She'd, someone would open up the balcony doors and she would step out, this little figure, and the whole crowd would roar with delight and joy that they got a glimpse of the freshly crowned Queen. And then she'd step back inside for a little bit. And then every, after a while, the crowd would start up the chant again because they just wanted to see the queen. And again, she'd step out. And this moment of great rejoicing, this like a roar would come up from the crowd. We want the queen. And then the queen would appear. And then she'd go back in again for a bit. And they'd... But the guy telling this story, he, he said it was an amazing event. And he, but he said, imagine, imagine that in the middle of that, that a messenger came out of the palace and kind of worked their way through the crowd, almost ignored by everybody else cheering and shouting. And a messenger came up to you, just one among tens of thousands of people in that crowd, and said, the Queen would like to see you. The Queen would like to you to come in through the crowd, into the courtroom, into the throne room, and to see her personally. And imagine being led through the crowd, through all the shouts of, we want the queen, 
in between the throng, thronging masses, up into Buckingham Palace, through an entrance and through a corridor and through a hall, into the throne room, and there is Queen Elizabeth saying, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to get to know you. I'd like for us to talk together. That, that is just the imaginary part of the story that this chap was saying, having, having imagined that moment of closeness and connection. And you see, that might sound fantastical and ridiculous. And that might sound something that would never happen, but actually, that's the story of our relationship with God. That we're not just called to be part of a massive crowd of people chanting out praises from a distance, kind of collectively, but actually we're called into a close relationship with God himself. And Jesus demonstrated that in, in his journeys around. There'd sometimes be massive great crowds of people, but he would focus in on one person. And in his physical presence, he, he couldn't spend all of that time with every single person he met. But he would demonstrate the heart of God to make individual connection with people, with the crowd. Oh, there'd be a crowd of people pressing in on him, and one woman would touch the hem of his cloak. And he'd say, who touched me? And he would engage personally with her. There'd be a crowd of people listening. And he'd see Zacchaeus in the tree. And he'd say, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Salvation has come upon your house. From amongst the great big bellowing crowd, God builds a relationship with individual people, with you and me. And here's... Here's the thing I've been thinking about, though, is that, is that if you were that person in the crowd outside Buckingham Palace and you were called on in, I don't know about you, but I'd probably feel a little bit intimidated about meeting a monarch. Um, I, although having said that, I do have a pretty close relationship with Prince Charles, or now King Charles, and here's a photo, here's a photo of us together. Um, you can see the closeness of our relationship there. You can just about make out the side of my head. Yeah, no, I'm, not the, I'm not the block of ice. I'm, uh... that's, that's me up there. I, I, had the, I had the privilege of sharing one sentence with Prince Charles. He came along a line of people and I said, he, said to, he said, oh, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm a curate. He said, oh, jolly good, and he, and he moved on. <laughs> no, um, actually, there's all sorts of uh, kind of like formal approaches for how you're supposed to talk to her. Yeah, there's a couple of people nodding. If you meet the queen or meet the king, you're, there's certain ways you're supposed to speak. There's supposed to certain things you're supposed to say. And, and I, think, I think there's kind of like two approaches to that. You, you, start off, you start off formal, but actually... The funny thing about this story here is the guy who was the head teacher of this school where Charles was meeting some pupils, the head teacher of this school, he, he, he set up the whole curriculum of the school based on one of Prince Charles' books. Prince Charles's books. I don't know if you knew that he wrote books, but he, he's, he's written a couple about the environment. And this, this head teacher based the school's teaching on the back of this book and Prince Charles heard about it and thought, this is great. And he, he, he wanted to get to know more. And so he got to know the head teacher. And so the head teacher, he found himself invited to, not to Buckingham Palace, because it wasn't in those, I think it was Blenheim Palace or somewhere. And he went and, and he, the first time he met Prince Charles was a very formal, serious, sort of, kind of somber meeting. And Prince Charles's people had, had Richard checked out. And then... Then actually they met again, and the next time they met was less sort of formal, and Prince Charles was more chatty. And over the course of, over the course of about five meetings, this, this head teacher, Richard, he found himself actually growing in a, a kind of a, like a, a no, no longer prince and head teacher, but actually two people who are interested in how to do things sustainably, 
how to, how to care for each other in a community where a lot of people are taking things for themselves. And he found there was kind of like a, a sh an exchange of ideas. And he, he found himself kind of forgetting that Charles was the prince, heir to the throne, and he kind of engaged in this just, just two people, which actually is what they both are. They actually are both two people. But the thing is, the same goes for our relationship with God. I, I think that we have this relationship with God where actually we can feel very formal. We can feel very controlled by words. We can very, feel very controlled by what we're allowed to say. But today, I want to talk about the Psalms and what the Psalms give as an example of how to talk to not just the King of England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland and the other bits, but actually how to talk to the king of the universe, the maker of us. Prince Charles didn't make us. God made us. We can talk, not just to the king here, but to the great almighty king, and we are invited into that closeness of relationship. We might start off with shouts of praise and wonder and joy, but actually we're invited into an intimate, close relationship with the living God. And... Um, I mean, the Psalms are packed with the most wonderful stuff. Psalm 13, um, we, we had a little bit of that one up in there. This, I think I thought this was a good example of one of them. Psalm 13, the first couple of verses of Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This isn't one of those Psalms where someone's all joyful and happy and like, yes, I want to praise the Lord, everything's fantastic, God's amazing, I'm doing amazingly. This is actually the psalm of somebody who is going through some misery, who's going through a really hard time. That phrase, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? That, that's somebody saying they feel like God's forgotten them. How long will you hide your face from me? The next verse, how long... Will I, will I, must I wrestle with my thoughts day and day? And day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Now this is not just, like, I don't know if you feel like you've got enemies, but, you know, you might feel like your enemy is like somebody in an office who is thwarting your application for a form to be submitted. You know, that... This is, they're not talking about enemies like that. They are talking about, about enemy nations declaring war on them and killing the people in their land. Taking this village or that village, taking slaves, taking plunder, taking livelihoods. How long will my enemy triumph over me? These are, these are the deepest rooted pains. This, this is what's going on in Ukraine. How long will my enemy triumph over me? That is what the people of Ukraine are saying as they are invaded by enemy soldiers who are doing the most hideous things. As rockets just flung over, indiscriminately killing people. There is, there is an expression of emotion in this psalm and in other psalms that comes from deep in the place of pain and despair. And the question that's asked here by the writer is how long? How long? Is it going to be a year? I mean, the, the, the Ukraine crisis, the invasion, it's lasted a year so far. But actually, Russia had been occupying parts of Ukraine since 2014. So that, that cry is not just a year's cry, but it's nine years cry. It's the cry going back to the 1930s when, um, when Stalin ordered that Ukraine would be, uh, the food in Ukraine would not be spread uniformly throughout the country, but it would go through channels that diverted the food to Russia. And so in the 1930s, a starvation happened across Ukraine where about, about four to six million people died of starvation in the 1930s in Ukraine called the Holodomor. So the cry of the heart in Ukraine right now is not just for one year or seven years, but it's for a hundred years. How long will my enemy triumph over me? And you might think, well, you know, no, sorry, you're not allowed to talk to God like that. You know, if you started in on King Charles and said, how long are my taxes going to be like this? How long are there going to be potholes in every single road? You, you, actually, an, an advisor might step in and say, I'm sorry. 
you're not allowed to address the king that way. That, that actually, that this psalm gives us permission to say that. Maybe not to King Charles, but to God. You can say to God, how long, how long is this injustice allowed to stand? And you could cry that if you're in, you know, the, the, the fight against slavery. You could cry. You know, there's so much, there's so much injustice in the world now. How long is that allowed to go on? It's all right to come to God with that cry. It's all right to come to God with a cry of anger. That's expressed in the Psalms. It's all right to come to God with a cry of fear, because that's expressed in the Psalms. It's all right to come to God with all this stuff. You can't, you can't, um, I started that sentence wrong. It's, it's not that there's certain things you can share with God, and other things actually, no, you shouldn't mention those to him. We're in an intimate, close relationship with the living God. And, and also in the, other, in the other books of the prophets as well, you'll also find other expressions of deep, deep, wrenching emotion. You'll also find expressions of boredom. Like there actually there are moments in, in the prophets and in the, the Psalms where it's almost kind of like they're people who are just like they're in, a, they're in a stale, dry, still place. My soul thirsts for you. It's not just about too much emotion. Sometimes it's about, I'm just not feeling anything. And it's okay to express that to God too. It's okay to say, Lord, I, I, I knew you so well. Five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago, it's all right to say, Lord, I just long for that feeling that I had, your closeness, my soul thirsts for you, my very being cries out for you. Do you know, it, this, this psalm, Psalm 13, um, it, it starts off with the kind of like the misery bits, and then it, it ends up with a nice kind of like, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. So he goes to the miserable parts, and then he goes, yeah, no, but it's, I, I do trust. I do trust in your unfailing love. Actually, I'll even sing the Lord's praise, for he's been good to me. Yeah. So in, in Psalm 13, it's got a bit of both. It's got a bit of the misery, and it's got a bit of the confidence, the hope, the joy. So you might think, oh, actually, okay, no, I've got to be, I've got to be miserable, if I'm miserable, and then afterwards I've got to be joyful. And I should come out at the end of it joyful. Psalm 88 is not like that. Psalm 88 is miserable start to finish. Let's have this bit of it here. Why, Lord, do you reject me? Okay, here we go. But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Again, there's that sense of... Why are we separate? Why is, there a, why is there something between us? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors, and I'm in despair. Terrors and despair. Your wrath, your anger has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. Someone said to me a couple of weeks ago that, that it really bugs them when they don't spell neighbor right. Um, if that's what you're taking from this reading, then you've probably missed the fact that this person is in such a hideously horrendous place. Darkness is my closest friend. Oh, my word. This psalm does not end with words of joy. Psalm 88 is miserable from start to finish. There's no declaration at the end which goes, oh, no, actually, I know that everything's going to be okay. And I think Psalm 88 gives us permission to enter into that moment where everything feels lost. And do you know, right, we, 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 we may be familiar with little snippets of the Psalms, 
I think even possibly people who don't go to church might have heard Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, and have heard little bits of that. They might have heard it at a funeral once. And, and actually, if you've been coming to church or if you read the Psalms yourselves, you, you might be familiar with more of them. But the people at the time of Jesus weren't just familiar with them. They weren't just go like, oh, is that from, oh, I recognize, oh, is that from one, is that from 152, is that one from 148? They wouldn't be like that. They would be totally aware of all of the different meanings of all of the different Psalms. But this was like, this was like their top 50 hits that were played week after week on the radio. So they'd know all of them. They'd know all of the words off by heart. Even the people who weren't trying to learn them would just know them because they were so saturated within the Jewish culture. And we don't, we don't, we're not familiar with that. But Jesus, he was totally immersed in the Psalms. The writers of the Gospels, they, they hint at it with little snippets of verses all the way through stuff. And so here's a, here's a verse that, that um, I found fascinating for a while. Um, here we go. This is, this is the end of the story when Jesus has shared the Last Supper with the disciples. Right? He's, he's shared bread and wine with them, and he's given clues that something is about to happen, and they're a bit baffled as to what's going to happen. Jesus is about to be arrested, but before they go out to the garden, this is what it, this verse says. Matthew writes, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, to, to us, it's like a hymn. Well, could be 10,000 reasons. Could be what a friend we have in Jesus. It could, you know, it could be like, that, that phrase doesn't mean much to us necessarily, but to the people who were Jewish, who were reading Matthew's Gospel, and Matthew mostly wrote with the express intention of, of kind of a, like explaining things to Jewish people, the Jewish people would have gone, ah, okay, this is one of just a small handful of, hymn, of hymns of praise from the Psalms that were sung after the Passover meal. But actually, Matthew has already indicated which, which hymn they were singing in the previous few chapters. Because Matthew doesn't just like, keep the Psalms separate, he weaves them through his gospel to indicate how important they are to these people who were the followers of Jesus. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. There's two direct quotes in there from Psalm 118. Just a few verses later, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, again, is a direct quote from Psalm 118. Matthew then, a couple of chapters later, For I tell you again, says Jesus, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A quote directly from Psalm 118. And Psalm 118 is one of those hymns that the Jewish people would especially sing on the day of Passover. The Psalms for them were a songbook that expressed their deepest emotions. Psalm 118 is a song of dedication, a song declaring the come who, one who comes in the name of Jesus. Psalm 118 is also a song of sacrifice. The sacrifice that was made at the first Passover and a sacrifice that was made at the second Passover. The Psalms were able to be an expression for them as they wanted to cry out for help from, Jesus, from, from God. Hosanna means God saves and God, come and save us. Come and save us from all that is oppressing us and crushing us. And so this, this songbook that they had had 
for generation after generation was given new meaning through the presence of their true Messiah. The living God, not just far off in a palace, but actually coming there and walking amongst the crowd, you could reach out and touch the hem of his cloak. There's not just a messenger from the king, but the king has come among us. And so now, we're here to be open to the living God. We meet him, he meets us. And if you want to know what it is you're allowed to say to him, look at the Psalms, you can say anything you want. You can moan about the most boring, tedious things of life. You can rant about the agonies of life. You can cry out for justice for those people who you despise and you despise their actions. You can cry out that God will act. Do you know, week after week, uh, Carol's been leading prayer for Ukraine on Zoom on a Tuesday night and it's, it's advertised in, in the midweek email that comes out. Sometimes I've just heard prayers in there that have been prayers that have been from so deep in the heart. Prayers about the anguish of what people there in Ukraine are going through. And in those, I hear a glimpse of what I see in the Psalms, just the deep expression of all of the longing that we have for God's peace to come, the longing for justice to come. And... I think us humans, I think sometimes we shut off some of those parts of ourselves. But the Psalms are an invitation to open them up again. Sometimes those springs of living water are not ones that God has shut off, but that we've shut off. That there are parts of us that we've, we've closed off inside ourselves. We don't want God to go there because actually maybe we're ashamed or embarrassed. But the Psalms say that even if you are ashamed or embarrassed, even if you're afraid, you can come before God with anything. So I, I was trying to figure out what would be an appropriate response to, to this sermon. I was trying to think through what it could be, but actually I think the thing that needs to be the response is to give you the opportunity to come before God with whatever is on your heart. And actually just to be open before God. So I think a few minutes of stillness is really important right now. Whatever it is you want to share. If, if there is nothing on your heart that you want to share with God, I would just encourage you to pray for the other people around you, just silently in your heart. If, if you think, oh, that's just a rubbish, ridiculous thing to do, Maybe just sit and have a couple of minutes of peace and stillness and just rest. But now, here, I want to tell you that the Psalms give you permission to cry out for help, to cry out on behalf of others, to be angry with God himself. Whatever it is you need to do, you may.
in day-to-day -day life, you might not get the opportunity to sit quietly in the presence of God. I don't know. You might be in a busy house. You might be in a busy life. But I think it's really important to carve out time to simply be in the presence of God without the TV on, without the radio playing, without a song singing, just in stillness and quiet if you can. I don't know if there's any places or people who've come to your heart while you've been just sitting in God's presence. I think sometimes God comes and meets with us and then sometimes he, he sends us to share that peace or that encounter with other people. So maybe uh, if there's anybody who's come to your heart, you might want to just resolve to actually go and share that peace with them. And I think also there's just one final thing that I wanted to share as a, a final point. is we're, the, next, the next song we're going to sing um, is um, a song... The words to it are, when all around is fading and nothing seems to last. It's actually a song about how this, this world doesn't always go according to plan. It doesn't actually go... Not everything turns out hunky-dory, and it's an acknowledgement that sometimes we walk through dark and hard times. Back, back 19 years ago, on, on Boxing Day, there was a tsunami in, in East Asia that killed 140,000 people. And that happened on that happened on the sort of the the evening before the Sunday. So it happened on the so the news was coming in overnight, and and I woke up on the that Sunday morning to that news, and I was leading I was leading the band, and I didn't know what I had no idea what to to do. And then then I saw this song, and we sang we sang this song that declares that even though everything is going wrong, God is present, and God has us. God has each one of us. And I think it's really important that as well as the songs of praise that we sing, as well as the songs of joy, we also get to sing songs like this that help us to acknowledge that there are people who are going through the darkest times. And in the middle of them, we'll fear no evil. Because God is with us. So, as we sing this... Bring before God in your hearts the places and the people who you know need to hear this. Bam, thank you. They were, they were wondering whether I was like giving the hint to get them up or not. And I, was, I, wasn't quite, I wasn't quite there. So whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Central Africa, whether it's Turkey or Syria, whether it's some place or some person who is especially close to you, lift them to God and remember that he has them in his hands too. Let's, let's stand to sing this together, as we're comfortable to do so. <clears throat> He 
He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. I've been a He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Off in a river, for you are with me, strong to deliver, mighty to save. He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 I think it'd be good to have an opportunity if anybody wants to come and pray for a place or a person if anybody wants to come and declare God's praises if there's anything that you want to share I think we'll have a bit of a time with an open microphone if you um, want to come when I say an open microphone also I'd like to acknowledge that Martin has fixed this wonderful microphone stand that <laughs> is um yeah you don't know how good that is um please take a seat please take a seat if anybody would like to come and pray, um, please do. I want to pray for Dave West and Stella Blake and their ongoing struggles in hospital. Lord, would you continue to meet them in healing and hope? Lord, I thank you that there isn't a part of the world that isn't in your hands. So Lord, this morning we continue to pray for Ukraine. We continue to pray for Turkey and Syria in the aftermath of the earthquakes there. Lord, we pray for the people caught up in the train crash in Greece. Lord, there are so many things going on in our world that we we struggle to know what to do or, or how to respond or how to pray, but Lord, we thank you that you're already there moving in those places. Lord, we pray for the emergency services there. We pray for your church there, being your hands and feet in those difficult situations. Lord, we ask for your mercy and your justice and your wisdom and your blessing. Lord, we pray that you would meet those people at their deepest point of need even now. Lord Jesus, would you bring hope where there seems to be only darkness, life where there seems to be only death, joy where there seems to be only despair. 
Lord, prompt us to continue to pray for different parts of our world as they struggle. And thank you for all the prayers you're praying even now in heaven. Jesus, we say amen to your prayers too. Amen. Amen. Lord, I want to lift our country before you. And there's, there are so many things that we should be able to celebrate, but there is also so much that is, it feels like it's going wrong in this country at the moment. And Lord, we don't have the solutions, but you do. So Lord, I pray for our government. Lord, may they have wisdom, integrity, courage, and compassion. Lord, may, have they, may they have the care for individuals that we saw in the life of Jesus. Lord, may they have wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, there's going to be an opportunity for more prayer and a different uh, emphasis of prayer this Saturday. Um, Saturday the 11th, uh, we're going to have our regular kind of session of prayer and fasting. So, so however you want to do it, um, we're encouraging people from the church uh, on, on regular days during the year to fast and pray. There'll be a prayer meeting here at 11 o'clock next Saturday. So you can come and join in with that. You can fast beforehand. You can fast afterwards. You can fast from food. You can fast from watching telly. You could fast from wearing makeup. I, I won't be affected by that one myself. But actually, it might be something that you kind of feel like you rely on day by day. Actually, just put that thing aside and rely on God that day. And you could do it before, afterwards. But um, you can also come and gather here in prayer on that day. Another thing that's happening um, for people in our, our local area, um, All Saints Marlow, uh, the church down in the centre of Marlow, I say centre, it's kind of like by the river, don't know if that is the centre. You know, the pointy one, down by the bridge. <laughs> um, they're, they're having a kind of a session of praise and worship tonight. Um, I don't know if you've heard about the, the kind of renewal and revival that's going on in a college in America called the Asbury College. Um, they want to kind of echo that and just actually, rather than having a talky service where somebody says stuff, they want to have a praise service where people just simply praise God. So 6.30 tonight at, at All Saints Marlow, there are kind of a gang of people who are going down there. Paula, is, are you a good person to ask about getting down there? Yeah, Paula I think might be going and a few other people might be going. Um, talk to Paula after the service. Um, now, most weeks we have a connect um, which has lots of information about the things that are happening in the church during the week um, Sarah had to go and deal with some personal business on Friday um, so she was unable to print them I in her place tried to deputize to print them and I managed to print three <laughs> two of them were two of them are in the wrong order actually no I printed four one of them was half size so it was kind of like and then I got one of them right. And then I tried to get the printer to do it again, and I couldn't, I couldn't get any more. I couldn't get any more out. So I got one right one, 
and three wonky ones. I've given away one wonky one already to somebody at the 9 a.m. service. So there's one right one with a couple of notes on it. If anybody needs a connect, that can only be three people, and we will we'll send out a digital copy of this, so anybody who needs the information on here can. Um, there is, I think, just one reminder I'd like to give, is that Gordon, who used to, um, amongst other things, he would help lay out the chairs in this room. It's his funeral on Thursday at, uh, to get the time right, 11.30. And there's, there's refreshments available afterwards. Um, we'll, be, we'll be gathering to honour him and remember him. And also, I'd just like to give you one final encouragement. Martin, reading the Psalms here at 10.30 each weekday morning, um, it, it's an opportunity to sit in the presence of the Word of God and reflect and hear the Psalms read out the way they're supposed to be. Um, I reckon, I would love to encourage, I know a lot of people work Monday to Friday, so they can't make it in that time, but I would try, love to encourage everybody in the church, even just to pop along just once during Lent, to come and just sit and listen to the spoken word of God. Um, are there any other notices that anybody would like to share? Yes, Sheena. Oh, is it about last week's? Do you know, I didn't even say that one. That's here. Go, on, go ahead, please. Well, just to follow on from um, la thank you. Um, last Sunday's um, services on fair trade, thank you all um, for your support of the fair trade stall. Um, with orders, we, we will have taken about £480. So that's wonderful in this financial sort of climate we're in. So thank you so much. And um, also, I think donations were sent to transform trade. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Sheena. And I, I think it's, I think I, I am constantly blown away by the generosity of this congregation. That in the middle of, in the middle of the climate that we're in, I, I hear of gifts and I see gifts and I am, I'm in awe of the generosity of people's hearts. So please do not ever feel under any obligation or pressure to give but I see the generosity of joyful giving. So please, as long as God is encouraging you to do that, please do. We're going to close with a, a short session of worship, just a, a few last songs. Um, so let's stand together and we're going to praise God. Be your name. Bless 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Heart and lead me 
So may you know that you do not just have um, an empty invitation to be with the ruler of all in a close personal relationship. May you know that the relationship you can have with the ruler of the universe can be close and warm and all-encompassing through every part of every stage of every life that we go through. And so may God's blessing rest on you and rest in you. May you know the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. May you go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.
Amen. Before you go have a cup of coffee, uh, Roger has introduced me to a new technology called photocopying that apparently means, apparently means that you, the, the thing I printed out, he can make more copies of so that our copies of Connect out there. Bless you all. Have a great week. Bye, Zoomers.